So welcome. So this is the panel on climate, climate adaptation and policy. Um, and so we have a wonderful group of people here to talk to you folks about it. Um, so I'm, I was going to go in alphabetical order, which I think by first name they are. Anyway, <laughs> so we will start with Glenn. So Glenn, just wave your hand. Yep. So that's Glenn Sharp. Glenn is a professional engineer and entrepreneur in green technology. He's also a business owner and head of Sharp Management and also Wetland Treatment Solutions. Uh, these firms are local Newfoundland and Labrador firms, and Glenn has the rather prestigious honor of creating the first CSA registered carbon offsets in the province. And uh, they're coming from the treatment and uh, wetland sewage and wastewater uh, in the Stephenville installation and the Appleton Glenwood installation. Uh, and Glenn designed and built those through Abadoz Environmental, of which he is also part owner. Uh, and you can generally find Glenn and Goobies uh, at his engineering office and nursery, which are both carbon neutral. Thumbs up, Glenn. <laughs> um, so next in line is Dr. Kathleen Perwick. Have, have I said that right? I, ha I honestly had, like I woke up in the middle of last night, I was like, do you say the E? Do you don't say the E? <laughs> Parwick, thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Parwick uh, is a program manager and community planner and facilitator who supports um, municipality, municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador's extensive municipal advocacy, policy and practice related efforts. So she does this by uh, supporting research, content development, community and public outreach and education activities for the organizations, so for municipality, so MNL. Does everybody know who our MNL is? I'll just abbreviate, okay. So for MNL's 276 member municipalities. So um, the diverse files on her desk currently include the sector's asset management, uh, which is BAM NL, which I think Kathleen is gonna talk about. Um, and this is uh, regional government and also welcoming committee campaigns. Um, Kathleen's doctoral research examined community scale climate change adaptation in the Canadian Arctic. And she has contributed to numerous other climate change related projects, which include uh, the seven steps to assess climate change vulnerability in your community toolkit, which was produced by the government, the provincial government. And I have used that, it is very good, thank you. Just as someone who, <laughs> who took it up in the end. Um, and so we welcome Kathleen, thank you. Uh, we'll just go in the order. So Neil Daw, can you wave, wave? Uh, Neil is the owner and president of Tract Consulting, which is a local firm uh, that since 1998 has provided professional planning, landscape architecture and civil engineering services to various communities and private businesses in the province. Uh, also the provinces of Ontario and Nova Scotia. Um, Neil travels the province extensively and has worked with uh, communities and businesses of all sizes. He is a leader in sustainable community planning, design and construction and has been recognized nationally and internationally for his work. Neil has also co-authored a white paper on sustainable community planning and developed uh, and trademarked in Canada a planning and economic development tool called Place Builder. And this supports communities to develop a coordinated community work plan uh, with, as it relates to lots of things, including sustainability. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Jeff Parker. You just wave, wave, <laughs> not at me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so Jeff is deputy mayor of Lark Harbor. Um, Jeff moved to Western Newfoundland about three years ago and got involved in volunteering in municipal politics in the Bay of Islands and Greater Humber area. Um, and the unprecedented flooding in this region in January 2018 left the towns declaring states of emergency. It left communities isolated and major infrastructure destroyed. And it gave him firsthand experience of the climate crisis and the need for adaptation by local, provincial and federal authorities. And you're gonna share some personal stories with us, I believe, right? Yeah, excellent. So we have a great group of people here. So you'll each have 10 minutes to speak. I will set you on a timer and give you one minute warnings and then you'll get the hook because I have been told I need to be ruthless with timekeeping. So I will do my best as the redheaded <laughs> crazy one in the room. Um, so the purpose of this discussion is that we would like to explore how policy can invoke action around climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So 
the whole purpose of decarbonize and L is focused on mitigation activities, right? Like that, that's the idea. So you're reducing your emissions. Um, but Jeff will also tell us firsthand that even when we try and reduce even where we are, we are still going to be facing some very serious adaptation requirements. And so we have to kind of look at the confluence of those things and how we find solutions that address maybe both at the same time, maybe one or the other, but uh, we see how we can move forward. So the session structure generally um, will be five minutes by me. Each of the panelists will get 10 minutes to talk. Um, we'll go through the Q&A process, which will be the same as your previous sessions. You'll have a few minutes to discuss with your neighbor to ask a question. And then we will do the citizens assembly. Um, and I got some feedback at lunch, so we'll structure that a bit different because I think most of you found it quite overwhelming and that you couldn't address all of the ideas very well. So I think we'll, we'll take a slightly different approach and I'll explain when we get there. Um, and we'll do, of course, the democracy and recap. So, oh, babies. Um, so, we will move now. Does anyone like to go first? I don't think it matters what order you guys go in. Your things are independent. Do you want me to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Yes. Come. I'll be doing mine. I'm taking the stage here. Yeah, so. Which one was yours? So this is yeah, Kath. There you go. OK. Sorry. Oh, how do I make it full screen? Oops. Can, if you go to view, you can go slideshow. Yeah. So you've got it. You've got it open there already. Yeah. Uh, here, yeah. It's full screen mode. That's it. Full screen mode. There you go. That's Murphy there, I believe. First of all, thanks very much, everybody, for turning up and attending. Um, just to sort of introduce myself. Um, and I've lost the pictures, so that's okay. It's only a picture of me in so you right now. Deputy Mayor of uh, in Lark Harbour. I'm also Vice Chair of the Greater Humber Joint Councils and the Chair of the Outer Bay of Islands Enhanced Committee. And while I represent those communities, what I'm saying here is my view only. I am not a climate change expert. But, and I've rewritten my presentation multiple times because what I want to really do is highlight the practical experiences and observations of how climate change actually in influences adaptation and policy in rural towns like my own and maybe your own. Because I'm sure, how many other people are here represent municipalities, whether they be um, councillors or, or town staff? There's a few, that's good. But how many of you live in a mun municipality? Yeah, exactly. So you've got to say. So, I'm hoping the pictures turn up, or else this is going to be uh, this is going to be a really bad. I'm going to have to take it out of full screen, and hopefully, oh, it's lost all my pictures. So, oh, okay. Use this one. There we go. So fantastic. Now, technology is wonderful. So, just in case you don't know where Lark Harbour is, we're out on the west. You know. We're, we're a rural town. The coastal drive on the south shore from Cornerbrook is worth the drive alone, and I know Neil will, will attest to that. It's an area of a scenic beauty, diverse geology, unique collection of hiking trails, which are all close together. It's the sunset capital of western Newfoundland, the home of the Orange Dory, and the town of just over 500 people. And while fishing is still important, the closure of the fish pond and the aging conversation of population has really tried to look for it. But doesn't it all look wonderful? The thing is, there's a darker side. 160 kilometer an hour sustained winds in December 2016. A house blown down, fishing boats and trucks over to damaging storm surge. And then in 2018, snow cover, plus a rapid thaw, 20 degrees rise, plus significant rainfall. And you see Ryan Snowden there when he was still around, pointing at 102 millimeters of rain. Bad things happen. Trout River. Roads and properties flooded, wharves completely or partially destroyed, state of emergency declared. Woody Point, roads and property flooded, wharves, uh, sorry, uh, landslides blocked roads. 
corner brook. Here you see uh, that uh, they had to put up berms to direct the water away from things. State of emergency, flooding road damage, little rapids, both lanes of the Trans-Canada Highway lost because of culvert damage and collapse. Humber Arm South, as you see, flooded houses, state of emergency. Town of York Harbor and Lark Harbor blown together. Normal pretty little brook became a raging torrent. Washed man-sized, and I'm talking about man-sized, I could walk in them, washed them 100 meters down the stream into the shore. Bridge collapsed. Both towns were cut off for two weeks. Helicopters needed to bring people in. Basic food supplies had to be brought in by the Coast Guard and local fishermen. Both towns declared a state of emergency. I personally spent 12 hours ankle deep in water bailing out my basement. And the thing is, we were cut off for a week and all the political commentators and critics talked about afterwards and still do. Eddie Joyce, our MHA, actually turning up out of his own money, bringing some of us a chicken dinner. And that's all that people talk about. It's wrong. So I'm gonna talk about adaptation, all the things that make you go, Arr! And so, so plan and prepare. I'm gonna take a quick di digression. You all live in municipalities. Make sure your emergency plans are revised and actively take into account climate change related events. Don't let a climate change event be the first time that you really have to dust it off and do things. Make sure your town, if, even if you're not on council, go and make sure that they're thinking about climate change when they're thinking about their emergency plans and work to create joint plans with local towns because these things will happen. Educate residents. Another digression is, I know everybody in this room has the same goal. The problem is, it's not necessarily shared. In a recent provincial election, I was talking to one of the candidates from a major party, and I, I brought up the question about climate change crisis. And his comment was, well, it's a really interesting point, but it isn't one which I've been asked to talk about by campaigning. So it's, it's, it's a mindset. I was also having some dental work and the dentist, educated man, I told him where I was going and he said, well, I've read about it, but I still don't know how it applies to me. So it is education. And in some ways in the life in, in, not, in Newfoundland more than anywhere else in Canada, People are used to doing things the way they want to do it. And some things are a way of life. Like you, people head out. They want to head out in their big trucks, chop down trees, and you know, press wild flowers. No, that's something else. Okay. So don't fall for the consensus fallacy that everybody thinks the same way. They don't. So I'm now really getting on to, let's talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure is going to take the biggest beating. It's costly, especially for small towns. Like even with government funding, it can cost small towns of like 500 people. You know, we're, we're half a million dollars in debt trying to bring clean water to people in our town and we're not getting there. Disaster relief will severely stretch the abilities and you need to plan ahead and set policies for climate phase. It won't be easy because residents will not see how it impacts them. Even when it hits them in the face, you saw those things. And the other thing is, Asset management is something that is very important. It's going to be tied to what you need to do to handle these things. Look at this picture. This is the incongruity of things. We had massive amounts of rain flooding. I bailed out my basement. And guess what? I lost my water supply to my house. There's all this water around me, but my house. That rock fell down in the stream, blocked off. Right. The following... Summer, we had record rains, uh, sorry, low rains, but then in the month, we had no rain and everybody's wells dried up. Following winter, extreme cold and wells and supply lines froze. But the thing is, when you're trying to do this with major water and sewer projects to try and adapt, you're finding that there, there are problems put in your face, the cost, the expense, and it's crushing for small municipal towns, even big towns to do municipality. And in the end, the balance from federal, provincial, municipal funding is all wrong. We should be looking at ways to get the money to the towns, whether that's a case of sort of taking 1% of all sales tax and actually directing it straight to municipalities so they can do what they need to do to solve the problems, which includes this, this trouble with infrastructure. Let's look at some infrastructure damage, damage in, a, in a particular town. And I talked to the previous uh, 
personally was looking to look after this session, kind of in this one. The top picture, you can see how here's a culvert. Culverts will come up again and again. You get fed up of hearing these. Where a culvert, where you see the water, where's the water going? It's going over the top of the culvert, not down through it, because the culvert collapsed. You see the damage on the road. We got disaster relief funding for this, but it was only to return it to the condition that it was before the damage. So essentially, where there was an opportunity for federal and provincial disaster relief funds to do it, they still got in the way of the town to actually do what was needed to prevent it happening in the future. We'll put it back to where it was, and so the next time when we have one of these events, it's going to happen again. Oh, two minutes. And the real problem, why we had that, see this picture here? That, that, that's waste deep water. That was from the Department of Fisheries and, and Oceans property, disused where their culverts are blocked up, flowed down, destroyed the town's infrastructure. It's all very different. What's wrong with this picture? That is a culvert. But be, whether it was because of the engineering design or the way it was built, and uh, when we had the event, it washed out. Basically, the tendering process, which is around at the moment, is a problem. We have, rarely have the expertise to get it right. And the lowest common bid leads you to situations like this. Here's another one. Forrest Gump would say, Mama always said, stupid is as stupid does. Well, guess what? This is repairing some damage with, uh, with culverts and ditching and water running down. They put this on the side of the road that the water runs down. The ditch, they put it on the other side of the road. You see the flag people standing there when the heavy rain, water. They spent a million dollars on this. It's on the wrong side. It's doing the wrong thing. You know, you get Department of Transportation and Works. Trying to get in touch with them is really difficult. This year, winter, they, they worried about more storm damage, so they sent out crews to, to dig. Of course, it's in the snow. They couldn't see what they're doing. What do they do? They actually dig up and damage the culverts to prevent things in the future. Look at here, down below. What's the difference between the sea level and the houses? Not very much. In fact, if you look at the seaweed line, it's right next to the road. When we start getting storm surge, and this is a picture of storm surge, which brought um, damage sort of 45 feet into the land. If that happened to happen the other way, that entire bottom area of the land would have been d destroyed. So what I can sum up in this postcard from uh, Lark Harbor in Newfoundland is all levels of government and individuals need to be doing something about it now. While the issues are big, there needs to be more cooperation and cooperation between federal, provincial, and municipal levels. Everybody should be at the table. It's about doing solutions and not bureaucracy. There is not a consensus mindset that the issue directly involves town residents. And in the end, you've got to come up with carrots, big juicy carrots, not sticks, for people to actually look at adaptation and climate change and how it impacts their rural communities. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, this should be fun. Uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully there's a little bit of tech support Oops. more than. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, excellent. Uh, yeah, be me. Excellent. All righty. Wow. We're going we're gonna to build now from one municipality's perspective to the organization that actually represents municipalities in, in the province. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador is, uh, we're a non-governmental organization, a membership uh, organization uh, and our members are the municipal councils in, in the province. So municipal decarbonization here. What's that going to look like? This actually turns out to be a, a really nice uh, conversation for us right now, a timely one, because uh, Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador is actually just embarking on the process of reviewing our strategic plan. And already, you know, in the initial conversations of our board, uh, the climate change uh, file has moved its way up 
uh, up the line uh, into, into one of the things that everybody feels a need to be addressing this time around. So what I'm going to do is, is basically just offer you a little bit of local government context, uh, you know, both in the circumstances of, of this province and uh, nationally, and talk then a little bit about municipal policy areas, if you will, sort of writ large as they relate to climate change, and uh, sort of drop in a few little uh, bits and pieces about what m &L has been at. There, there actually is a national scan that was just completed on local adaptation in Canada. And of course, uh, adaptation has really been where the bulk of the activity in Newfoundland and Labrador seems to have been uh, in the last number of years. So, so uh, we definitely do have some catching up to be done in our sector as it relates to the conversation around decarbonization or mitigation uh, you know, and, and rounding that out. But certainly on the adaptation side, you know, some interesting interesting trends there that you can sort of look at nationally and, and recognize that, you know, yeah, that some, some of these are, are definitely ours too. You know, the above normal rains and, and snowfalls, the storm events, all of the stuff we were talking about this morning, of course, the flooding. And then when you start looking at it, what, what are communities actually choosing to do about it? Um, the adaptation actions that you're seeing really do revolve around those conversations on infrastructure. You know, that that is one of the most obvious places where, uh, where the municipality is affected. And then movements into the space of, of actually doing some research risk management and, and assessment. And, and mitigation has been, you know, sort of typically one of the things that, you know, has been a little bit further down on, on the to-do list. And of course, that's national, you know, so so here we are in Newfoundland and Labrador, we, we need to sort of bump up some of those, those coastal impacts, uh, coastal communities facing erosion, facing those storm surges and, and sea level rise. A little bit about municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, also to keep in mind when we're when we're perhaps looking at national trends and and things elsewhere. We have barely half a million people, and we have two hundred and seventy six municipal governments. Two hundred and seventy six, and then we've got local service districts and unincorporated areas that people are living in, and uh, we don't have any sort of regional organizing principle that, you know, sort of consolidates some of these, these uh, governance functions in a fashion where we can have some economies of scale. Instead, what we have are 276 municipal governments, fully three quarters of which have one or fewer full-time staff equivalents. So think about that when you think about, you know, things getting more complex, which, which they are. The municipal sector is tremendously complex. You've heard a little bit about it already. There are a lot of competing priorities. Uh, the wastewater system effluent regulations, you know, has, has everybody in an uproar right now. You know, we're, we're looking for different uh, types of solutions than uh, many of our peers across the country. You know, these all have to be kept in mind. The sort of advocacy that we've done on climate change, the last time we were asked was back in 2016. And the provincial government was going through the process of developing a climate change uh, strategy at the time. So m &L had been uh, working closely with NEON, a variety of files at the time. Uh, they had given us uh, a bit more information than we certainly had at the time about net metering and how important it was to have some sort of a market basis to be able to support the kind of R&D that is associated with uh, creating an alternative energy market in, in a place. So Newfoundland and Labrador, of course, had been sitting on it. You know, it was it was representing a, con a conflict or a competition, if you will, with uh, the Muskrat Falls mode of operation. And uh, anyways, it was it was a major area of, of us and advocacy at the time. We also were asking for actions around sustainable community infrastructure, including changes to the uh, the Public Tendering Act, which was coming up for review in that uh, time frame as well, specifically to be able to allow uh, su more sustainable goods and services to be considered, even if they weren't necessarily going to be the low bid because that was how things used to work. Um, we were also wanting to see more uh, attention paid to follow up around some of the existing adaptation tools. We are, are, there was a reference made to this. I was involved in the seven steps uh, toolkit development back when I was a PhD candidate at, at Memorial working with Dr. Kelly Vaden. And there were a variety of really good tools, but 
communities, I've just told you how we have capacity issues, the communities needed a hand. They needed facilitation in order to be able to work through some of these resources. And of course, we also wanted a seat at the table, you know, as we as we move forward and looked at, uh, at climate change action. And in many respects, we did fairly well. You know, several years later, a number of those things, we've seen movement. We actually do have net metering now. It's got a very low cap. We've still got work to do there. But you know, there, there has definitely been progress. When we're thinking though now, you know, as we, as we move ahead and we plan next steps, uh, there are, if you will, certain conventions or typical areas of municipal policy that always come up. And, uh, you know, these include, of course, land use and development control authorities, uh, the, the whole conversation around infrastructure. We are consumers. We, we purchase uh, infrastructure. We purchase goods and services. Transportation, you saw this morning, uh, transportation and uh, heavy industry, those were our two biggest contributors to greenhouse gas uh, emissions in this province. So this is a big area for us as well to, to move the, uh, the needle, as well as there are other ways that we can, we can think about getting off uh, fossil fuels. So I'm just going to dance fairly quickly through these because some of these are going to be very obvious and we want to do a deeper dive on them in the, in the conversation later. But uh, obviously land use and development control authority, this is one of the mechanisms that municipalities can use in order to encourage more compact development, all the energy serving, savings that come from having things more closely located you know, to one another. Uh, it's also the mechanism that allows you to say you won't put that hospital in the floodplain, just to use a random example. Um, and, and, and to also think about habitat and, and some of the water retaining features in the landscape. You know, so, so there are a variety of mechanisms that, uh, that we rely on in our municipal plans and development regulations that allow us to do some of these things. Climate change is really asking us to start rethinking. There was an old planning maxim when I went to planning school about highest and best use for a given piece of land. And you know, you can think about that in, in a sort of conventional capitalist way, or you can start thinking about it in a climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation way. And that's that's one of the one of the push points, I think, uh, to keep in mind when we talk about development <coughs> controls. The, the issue perhaps to keep in mind as well is we only have just more than half of our municipalities uh, have municipal plans and development uh, regulations. So it's, it's a, not a, a thing that everybody's able to use. Thank you. Infrastructure design, procurement and operation. Uh, a lot of opportunities here, uh, lead program activities, material selection. There, there are new cement mixes that are not going to add to the load of greenhouse gases that you know conventional uh, cement mixes have. Asset management, this is a big one for us. Uh, Another, another material science uh, opportunity with respect to, you know, rethinking wood and perhaps being able to reduce our reliance uh, on metal structural uh, components. But asset management planning, this is the cradle to grave piece. This is a requirement under the current gas tax uh, agreement um, that, uh, that the province has negotiated with the provincial government. We are supposed to move the needle on getting municipalities to undertake more evidence-based approaches to how it is they manage their assets and how they choose to purchase them and replace them. And MNL is an implementing partner for one of the FCM programs, uh, the Municipal Asset Management Program, which uh, you'll probably hear a little bit more on, on asset management topics from Neil next. But just suffice it to say that we have a two-pronged approach. We have some of our larger communities with more capacity that we've been uh, working with to develop a community of practice around asset management in the province and smaller towns that we're bringing on side. We have uh, several cohorts uh, distributed around the province now. So asset management is uh, live and well and growing. Uh, transportation piece, uh, it, it covers everything from decisions we make around fleet uh, purchases right up to, you know, active transportation and, um, and ideas around how we can get ourselves off uh, vehicles. And some of the other ways we can, we can start looking at, at topics like uh, local agriculture and community energy planning and even reducing consumption with respect to things like plastics, which 
can't ever forget, they're part of that larger fossil fuels uh, plastics production chain that uh, we have to systematically figure out some way to dismantle piece by piece as part of the decarbonization challenge. Bing. <laughs> Uh, which one was, which one? Got, oh, so Glenn. Sharp, yeah. yeah, okay. And how do you go into play mode? Okay. There you go, and then you can just use the arrows. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, I'm going to run through a little bit of, well, who I am, Glenn Sharp, uh, and a little bit about my work experience, which put me in a mind of sustainability from very early on. And then talking about what I've designed and engineered wetlands and how I've moved into creating the first carbon offsets in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. I started with fishery products uh, as a junior engineer in the heyday of catching fish, 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 just catch as much as you possibly can. And when I went to work in 1987, the fish were this big. And I saw them go to this big. And I couldn't understand how they were sending out the fleet that when all the fish got together in a massive school offshore to spawn, the fleet went right through it and gobbled them all up. And I was sitting there as a young junior engineer on the dock, building wharves, infrastructure, saying, this won't last. And everybody else around me, no concern. When I moved into the oil and gas sector and I moved into working in oil and gas, I had the, the idea or the, the realization that, you know, the oil and gas was there. The, the oil companies came in, they, they took it out. I worked for Hibernia, Sable, Deep Panook. Um, but when that oil and gas is gone, they just go over to someplace else and they take it all again. And then they just keep moving and moving and moving. And I was looking at jobs around the world of where to go and what to do. And it was, you know, you can't go there. They're, they're finished up with oil. You have to go here and then they're going to go there and then they're going to, and eventually you're just going to end up. So sustainability became something was entrenched in me from seeing what was happening in the industries I was working in. But I moved on and then took a direction out of those non-sustainable oil and gas and went to create a small company to design engineered wetlands technology. We moved from Germany into Canada to build wetlands to do sewage treatment. And kind of accidentally, I got into creating the first carbon offsets because I was trying to make those wetlands 100% sustainable, zero cost to operate. So some of the projects that we put in in engineered wetlands for towns uh, and projects uh, for landfill, leachate at Norris Arm and uh, Bishop Falls, Stephenville, Apple and Glenwood. And the, the projects are very successful in doing uh, very good high levels of treatment and winning national and uh, regional awards. Um, this is the system in Appleton, Appleton doing uh, Treatment of the entire town of Appleton Glenwood combined, approximately 1,800 people. The green squares are the wetlands that we created inside a high density polyethylene liner. I won't go into exactly how they work, but the very, very simplicity is the plant transfers air from the top of the plant down into a dry zone, the root system. That air allows bacteria to live below the surface that would normally there, live there, and the bacteria consume the waste as it runs through. Sewage is their food source. And then bacteria consume the other bacteria, protozoa and other cells consume that and carnivorous and they eat themselves so you get clean water at the end. From the time in to the time out, 14 hours. Tertiary treatment standards going into the Gander River when the province only wanted us to build it to secondary treatment standards. This is the system in Stephenville. A uh, bit larger, twice the size, but dealing with a population of almost 8,000. You can see a small building, uh, the tanks are where the solids are separated, all the liquids run through, are cleaned and go out. So we wanted to make these systems even better because th there were green technology. I know we had some people coming forward with very little uptake. I mean, they were the same cost as the mechanical treatment systems of the lagoons, but it was, oh, it's too new, or my engineer doesn't really know about that, so he's not interested, or I don't want to be the guinea pig. So we were looking, and I was looking at from my own experience of saying, if we could make these zero cost to operate, you could put it in, your children would benefit, your grandchildren would benefit, your great-grandchildren would still have the systems and they wouldn't be paying for them. 
So how could we do that? We looked at a whole lot of different options and eventually I saw the carbon industry where it was going or I thought it was going back in 2010, 2012. And I said, okay, we can probably generate carbon offsets. The fact that we use no electricity, we could actually turn that into a savings that other people that have pollution would buy. The whole concept of offsetting your pollution. Those that can save it, save it. The savings that are achieved can be transferred to somebody else that is a polluter, they can buy your savings. That way the world is getting a zero net effect. Sure, they're not, they're still polluting, but you've saved over here, so the world sees it as a balance. So the basic concept of a carbon offset is significant savings in CO2 emissions compared to conventional sewage treatment. So if you were put in an aerated lagoon or a sequential battery or an RBC, Pumps are moving, aeration is blowing, electricity is being used to move that air all into the sewage. Here are plants do it all naturally, so there's no electricity. And I'm going to use the comparison of electricity because methane gas is a little hard to describe, but we actually generate our carbon offsets from methane gas reduction because when Muskrat Falls comes online, the electricity is not burned fossil fuels at Holyrood and it's going up the stack. It's actually going to go to a green technology with the dam so that you won't get the carbon offsets because it's green in a way. So if you can take these emissions reductions, the, the emissions that would have gone out the stack in Holyrood, comparing the, ele the electrical concept, that weren't needed because electricity is not used. Your system doesn't use electricity, the conventional would. So if you say whatever thousand kilowatts that would have been used, those emissions they can be captured, they can be quantified, they can be verified, they can be then audited and certified. You can get a carbon offset that CSA, Canadian Standards Association of Canada, registered. That's what we've done. We're the only company in Newfoundland to do it. We're the very first. We would go into the Newfoundland regulatory market, which is regulated to be bought by big polluters, but Newfoundland doesn't have one yet. So we have to be in the volunteer market because there is no regulated market. Unfortunately, the big polluters won't talk to us about buying our pollution, our credits, because they said we want to buy them from the regulated market, even though there isn't one. So we don't have to do anything for three years. Caught in the limbo of being too early, too fast. Maybe there's somebody in this room that would like to offset their carbon footprint, your car, your truck, your air flights. So this, no way already. Okay, I'll, I'll go fast, excuse me. <laughs> These are the, the, the launch of the carbon credits, which we launched with the premier last year. Um, some very progressive companies have gone forward. Acker Solutions Canada, MISA, Fundamental Inc. have offset a portion or all of their carbon footprint. But we're not getting an uptake from companies or the general public. There's a lack of understanding. Why should I do it? I don't see the benefit. But person. Purchasing carbon offset, I mean, you're purchasing a negative that was created, it's pollution that wasn't created because you didn't need the electricity, so you didn't create pollution in the first place, right? You as an individual or a company then can take that to offset your flight, offset your own pollution, become carbon neutral. Somewhere we need to take responsibility that we all pollute, we all drive cars, we all take flights. So you can reduce as much as you can, but you can't eliminate everything. So when you bring it down, how you get to carbon zero is you offset that last piece you can't reduce. To make it simple, if you just think of it this way, maybe I, I find people have difficulty understanding the whole concept. So just to make it simple, our two wetlands, Apple and Glen, would produce about 8,000 tons of CO2 savings a year compared to what a conventional system that would have gone in would have used. Cars use three to five tons a year, depending on your, your mileage and uh, how, how your foot hits the gas, but large trucks do 68 tons a year. So basically 8,000 tons relates to 1,000 pickups. So the next project, if we switch over one more project to the next project we put in, we save the equivalent of taking 1,000 Ford pickup trucks off our Newfoundland roads in carbon emission reductions. That's sizable, just from these little towns in Apple, Glenwood, Stephenville. Policy, now this session's on policy, so a couple of last final comments on policy and I'm on time, thank you. Uh, we need to have new technologies that reduce CO2 pollution. 
Green business needs to be seen as good business and it needs to financially be viable. We have to start paying in some way for the benefit of reduced pollution. Or conversely, we have to start paying for pollution. That little box of plastic that you buy in the grocery store with something in it, nuts, fruit, vegetables, whatever, you're paying for the commodity inside. You're not paying for the carbon footprint that that came from Argentina on planes. Plastic was produced to wrap it, to house it. Then it was taken apart. Then it was put in separate bags. And then it's put on the shelf. You're paying for only what you're eating. You're not paying for the cost of the carbon footprint of that. We have to get our minds around that. So we have to start thinking of buying by our choice. If you go to buy something substantial, a car, fridge, something, that a commodity that's being sold, ask the retailer if they know what the carbon footprint of this product is. If they go, oh, I don't know. Well, then they really don't care. So should you buy it? Should you make a better purchase? We must as individuals think about taking examples and leadership and rolling it in. We, you climb a mountain by little steps, one at a time. When you look at the daunting mountain, it's a huge mountain to climb, but you get there one step at a time. We all can take one step and one step will get you to the top of the mountain. Thank you very much. Uh, which one's yours? This one? I think they see. This one here? I hope. Oh, there you go. There we go. So I got 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to hurry, but I'm going to try not to rush. I'm going to talk um, really about, I'm going to first try to set a context for climate change related to municipalities. And then I'm going to suggest uh, 15 15, ladies and gentlemen, 15 policy directions communities should consider as they move forward. Before I forget, begin, I want you to recognize that every community has unique climate change uh, challenges that's specific to place, and that climate change adaptation can support dealing with those challenges. I also want to let you know, as Glenn has demonstrated, the technology has a really big role to play in climate change adaptation. And I also want to remind you that uh, municipal leaders have walls of information coming at them and they're trying to pick through it and say, what is the Zeta cop? She says, you know, the important thing is do the first thing first. So how do you decide what the first thing is? So we've developed our place builder model around developing a prioritized community work plan for municipalities. So to set the context, first in Atlantic Canada, as, as my ABLE presenters have shown, there's big impacts, particularly in coastal areas. Uh, water and to a lesser degree fire are the big challenges in Newfoundland and indeed in the rest of Canada. We have if sea level rise is really coming. A lot of our coastal communities have a real challenge, particularly low lying infrastructure. We know the water is warming and we heard this morning in some other uh, lectures, folks talking about fish stock migration because of temperature change. When we look at the province from the perspective of planning and policy, it's a hierarchy we got to keep in mind. We need to update the Provincial Urban and Rural Planning Act. Uh, I don't think you'll find climate change in that act. It's 1976. We need to complete the Northeast Avalon Regional Plan for this area. Keep in mind in Northeast Avalon, the Harris Center tell us, I think in 10 years, 50% of our population is going to be living on that little spit of land. And we also, as Kathleen mentioned, we need integrated municipal sustainability plans, we need asset management plans, and we need climate change adaptation plans for all communities. Climate change policy needs to confirm issues province-wide to set a context that's specific to Newfoundland and locally. So the context also has to be uh, driven by the Newfoundland context, but the local, the local landscape, the local ability to adapt. We need to look at the uh, the planning boundary needs to be nature's boundary, which is the watershed. And we need to focus on collaboration. This is bottom up and common challenges that many communities in those watersheds are dealing with. There also is a need to integrate climate change with public health, social resilience, and some might even say immigration. 
and use that information to recommend actions that focus on what the policy needs to be. So what can local governments do? First of all, citizens are looking for local government to pay, take progressive action. As I, I'm happy to see a couple of our councillors here from the city, I'm sure they'll agree with that, that we need progressive action and citizenry wants to see that local government is moving forward. But what local government is realizing, many municipalities now are engaging residents on the front end. They really are local climate change experts. Kathleen mentioned the document that uh, she helped prepared and prepare on climate change, that document is actually used for municipalities to be able to identify their community vulnerabilities and how they respond to climate change. And asset management and climate change help you identify what comes first and what it's gonna cost. And of course, partnerships as in everything else are critical. So what are the 15 community policy approaches? One, become a local adaptation leader. Communities need a leader like the deputy mayor that says, we need to adjust, here are our challenges, let's move forward. Municipalities have tremendous powers. Oh, I'm up. <laughs> Oftentimes, municipal leaders themselves do not understand the power that they hold to manage land. And this is all about how you manage your land base. Policy drives action. Policy drives regulatory control. So make sure that you're the policymaker, not someone that really doesn't understand your context. You need provincial legislation, which is why the Urban and Rural Planning Act is so important, and fiscal partnerships. And there is a fair degree of financial resources around right now that is being made available to municipalities. So, you know, the governments have really stepped up. And you also need to put a climate lens on your municipal operations. I would particularly suggest, as well as your fleet, but how we build. Do we need streets with an 11 and a half meter profile? If we bring that down to nine and a half, look at the asphalt we're saving, look at the carbon footprint we're reducing. And if we're really gonna have a car that comes pick you up and takes you to George Street, do we really need all those big parking lots? What are they gonna become in the future? And lots of communities are turning uh, gray and black into green. So we need a climate change lens on our entire municipal operation. And we need to look at ways that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there's lots of that going on as well. If you look at what the town of Baleen is doing with green energy for a small town, it's uh, quite impressive. Uh, some other speakers have talked about the need for an energy audit and retrofitting municipal buildings, but also to pursue energy efficiency in new builds. It's like we do a lot of, of of construction, but a lot of our bills, when I got to retrofit something to make it accessible, it costs a lot of money. When I integrate accessibility or energy efficiency into the build on the front end, it costs a whole lot less. Also looking at uh, alternative fuels such as biofuels and electric vehicles, the idea of refining, recycling and capturing methane gas like the city of St. John's is trying to do now in Robin Hood Bay and looking at the building code and how it could be modified for energy efficiency. And you know, they say they make the wind here in Newfoundland, and I, I believe it, but we don't really think about microclimate when we design. Simply adding a microclimate lens to how we build communities, for example, can really create a lot of opportunities for energy saving. We also need to enhance our digital mapping capabilities. In all of the asset management plans that we've done in the province, the thing that blows me away is the number of municipalities that don't have a map. Mapping geomatics is becoming, it's not just a map anymore, it's information, push the button. We're developing uh, GIS systems in communities of 250 people and they're using them. So the capacity exists and the, the tools exist and there's, we use a lot of open source software, so it's free. Tree retention, retention and natural areas preservation. A few weeks ago or a week or so ago, there was a study came out that said, we got to, if we spend this many billion dollars planting this many trees globally, we'll start to really seriously deal with climate change. In Newfoundland, we have an aversion to trees. We still have to hop on the bulldozer, clear out, and now it's perfect, 
put in the roads, and then we put in shrubbery, and give it a few years, it's dead. It drives me crazy. So we need to look at natural areas preservation. We start our planning by identifying what do we want to preserve, and the preservation should deal with what's important biophysically, what's important from a floodplain, flood, floodplain perspective, I, my alliteration is not the best. But what we also need to bring into that is what are the places in our community that are special to us and make our community, I will do it, and that, and that will, and it will make our, our community better. So there is the opportunity to integrate natural systems with built systems so that the, the natural asset becomes uh, an infrastructure asset and that train is starting to come down the track and in my opinion it's a good thing. So again, start your planning by identifying what you want to preserve and throw the cultural element in there because it attaches people to place, which is what our place builder model is all about. Amend your municipal plan for smart growth, compact areas, but if you're going to do compaction, you need to do really good design and you need to bring beauty and access to open space and amenity into the design mix. Not only drive me nuts and I digress, you know, seniors home with asphalt up to the door. You need to create places for people and utilize zoning for climate change land development. You can have special bylaws in coastal areas, in areas that it might be susceptible wind, susceptible to erosion. Your built form, when we do climate change adaptation strategies, a lot of the time we're having erosion control problems because we're putting streets at right angles to the slope, not running with the slope. So use climate zoning, it's very important. And lastly, realize, and this might sound counterintuitive, but we've heard it already, that these changes here are good. What I like about the climate change adaptation strategy and model is it's actually gonna make more attractive, more accessible communities and we'll finally stop putting things such as that building Catherine mentioned where they shouldn't be. And with the mapping, we'll be able to identify where those high risk areas are. And like we like to say, every community in Newfoundland should have a good map. And I thank you very much. All right. Um, so what we will do at this point is break ourselves up into, oh no, we have questions, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Um, here we go. So what we can do at this point is please take, we'll go with three minutes because we are a few minutes over to chat amongst yourselves um, or turn to your neighbor, just get some input uh, and try and create a question if you have one that we can ask the panelists and we'll go from there. And while you're doing that, I am going to find out where the flip charts are and I will bring them here. <laughs> okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Okay. I'm just going to interrupt everyone there now. Sorry, it's a little bit rude, but here we are. <laughs> Ruthless and all. Um, so, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask the panelists, we will open that up now. So, uh, maybe just do hands, I think. I, I'm not sure. The room is pretty small. Do you feel as though you need a mic? Do you just want to shout? You can use whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, David Peters um, from uh, Harbor Grace and St. John's. Mindful of three things, the need, this is to everyone, um, three things, the need to decarbonize, uh, the dangers associated with isolation, and the demographic shifts, um, the aging of the population of rural Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. Is it time, in your opinion, on balance, and it's difficult to answer this, I'm sure, is it time for us to pursue a democratically uh, governed and generously compensated resettlement program in Newfoundland and Labrador? Sorry. <laughs> Advocating yes or no myself, I'm just asking. I'll ask that first from point of view. Sorry, did you know I got I got uh, no, from my point of view, we have much bigger problems. We're taking our garbage and moving it halfway across this province continuously with the plan that it was better to have one super landfill than deal with your problem where it is. Our carbon footprint is created by uh, a lot of decisions that were made previous to what we know now. Um, moving our population, yes, is a, a big issue, but... Um, we have to take action and have it resolved and have something happening within five to ten years or it won't matter where you live exactly. I just, just, I, it's, it's a difficult question, but the population is already moving. If, if you look at uh, where the communities are growing, look at, look at Gander, the growth they've had. Uh, come from away was great, but there's not a lot of Americans moving to Gander. There, there are people that are moving from uh, rural Newfoundland because the demographic is, is aging. They want to be next to healthcare services, recreation services, retail, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's going to happen regardless. And there are a lot of communities in the island that you, it's difficult to find a cohort from, say, 17 to 40. And so it's, it's, it's happening. And it's one of the reasons we find why communities are really, really starting to work and cooperate. But that said, I don't want to give a doom and gloom picture of Newfoundland. I do not believe that's true. I think there are huge opportunities. The question for me becomes, are we smart enough? Well, we're smart enough, but will we cooperate, and collaborate, and work together to make it happen? I think that there's many communities in this province that are, some are really small, that are doing excellent. The other thing, I didn't mention this, I got to tell you, the other big deal in Newfoundland that we got to deal with is nobody knows who owns the land, particularly in rural Newfoundland. Nobody knows who owns the land in the communities. So imagine how helpful that GIS map would be for them. It's worth, it's worth a lot of money. I guess not everybody agrees. There you go, brother. At least it didn't drop. It's okay, actually. We can we can manage from here on, even if it does weird things. <laughs> I appreciate that is an extremely difficult 
things. And I tend to be pragmatic sort of person and living in a small rural community, which is an aging population. And you saw that picture. I showed a picture of what we call down below. If based on the way that the water level is rising, it isn't, should we, it's, it's going to happen. But I don't think you can force people out of their homes. I don't think, even though it's happening, people should have to leave their rural communities to, to, to get facilities, to get clean drinking water, to get access to things. I think, as, as Neil says, I think there are ways that all levels, from the federal, provincial, municipal, and citizens, can all work together to actually make things happen. The problem at the moment is everybody looks after themselves. They don't want to talk amongst each other. And that, to me, is one of the biggest issues involved in solving this whole looking at trying to decarbonize, adapt, all these things is because people don't communicate and they don't appreciate what the real issues are because they live in their own little bubbles, whether that's at the federal level or down at the individual citizen level. And until there is that discussion and talk and, and real belief amongst all levels, you will not see a, a proper solution. And that, that's the way I look at it. And I'll just uh, wrap up by uh, uttering two words, regional government. Uh, this, this, uh, this has been an area of advocacy uh, for MNL. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For the last 15 years, I've only been with the organization five, uh, so this has a long history. Uh, there is regional government in every other jurisdiction in this country, uh, with the possible exception of Prince Edward Island, who arguably are a region all by themselves. So um, we, we need mechanisms like that that actually mean that everybody has some sort of representative uh, entity uh, because currently those local service districts, arguably, they might have a committee that is semi-functional. But basically, we've got about 10% of Newfoundland's population that lives outside of local government areas. And so they lack representation. They aren't necessarily contributing to the base either. But then we've got a whole bunch of, frankly, unsustainable communities at the lower end of the, that 276 number that I was talking about. So if we have regional government, we actually have a mechanism where the ones that are holding on by their fingernails right now because there is no soft landing actually have some place to go. Okay, that, that was some question. Um, so, because I, I, it's a complex problem and I think what we want to do is sort of hang on to those ideas and then use our discussion time to really flesh those out um, because we all have to work together. As you said, we're, we're clever people. We need to cooperate and we can do it. So we have time for one more question. I'm just wondering if there is any ongoing collaboration between um, municipal councils, um, perhaps with their communities or maybe even private sector partners to push the provincial government to raise the net metering cap. Um, if not, why isn't that happening? Um, if yes, what does it look like? And what is needed, do you think, to make that a more feasible uh, option? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start. Uh, I, I'm happy to share the 2016 submission that MNL made, which actually does refer to the, uh, the net metering policy uh, approach there. I think it's fairly safe to say that we would be holding the course and continuing to ask for uh, an elevation of that cap right now, because the one that they've got right now really prevents a lot of the community scale sorts of energy alternatives, uh, different sort of, you know, larger uh, sort of what neighborhood grid activities, uh, community utility development, any of those sorts of things are currently uh, prevented effectively by the uh, the cap that we have currently. It's We've gotten the, uh, the toe in the door, but we've got to shove her wide open at this stage in the game. So I think uh, continuing to work on that front is going to be essential. What community partners do you need? <sighs> we, um, the community 
the partners that we've been working with have been primarily the uh, the industry association, uh, NIA, to date. Um, I, I expect that in the context of a, a broader conversation right now around decarbonization, you know, Iron and Earth East, you know, represents a, a, a very clear voice uh, that will supplement that conversation quite nicely as well, I think. And, and I do think we've got a number of communities that are headed in the direction now that community energy planning has been something that uh, the FCM has been encouraging communities to look at under the Partners for Climate Protection Program, which has been around for years, but has had very poor uptake in Newfoundland and Labrador because it is a very sort of mitigation oriented uh, body of, of milestones. And that hasn't been where our communities have been starting from. Uh, I. I think we're kind of in a space right now where it's obvious what the cool kids are doing and the fact is we're not we're not with the cool kids yet. So um, I sorry, if I may, what I would suggest that we advocate for is that people actually max out what we have currently, and that's not happening. So most of the small communities you can put up a 60 kilowatt turbine and it will cover most of their emissions. It's only when you get into the really large situations like the, the summit center or something like that, the, the 100 kilowatt limit actually has an impact. I think the more important things to focus on, in fact, are changing the municipal regulations and any development guidelines that have zoning that just allow renewable energy to be installed. Because your average person needs, even for like McMansion types, you're still looking at like 25 to 30 kilowatts, which is well within the limit. Um, but we're not maxing it out. The last time I checked, there was, I think, 10 submissions and there was only like three installations actually completed that totaled, I don't know, something like 50 kilowatts total or something. Like, a, We need to do that first because I'm on your train. Like, shove the door wide open. Come on, folks. Like, you know. Break the, the door, door down. Well, uh, you know, so, uh, so I'm on board with that train. But the way you do that is to say, like, look, we've maxed out everything we need. Like, everything you've given us. Like, give us more. Look at what the rest of the world is doing. Let's do this. But so we, not, we have to do that first. Sorry, Glenn. Sorry. To not answer your question, but to tell you something a little different. I was over in Scotland talking to my cousin in a bar, and if I remember the conversation correctly, he was legislated, he had to put in some type of renewable generation with his house, or it wouldn't get approval to be built. California. It had to have solar panels, it had to have a heat pump, or it had to have a windmill, or it wasn't allowed to be built. Every house. We're so far behind, we forget how far behind we are. Our, our our politicians are so far entrenched and, and behind in the regulations. You got to break the door down and take five steps forward just to catch up. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're on the same train here, I think, in this room. So we're good. We're good. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is self-organize into groups of maybe 10 or 12. You can kind of go by rows. And I'm going to bring one of these to the front of the room. I'm going to put one back there and one back there. So I'm going to also ask you in a very... Uh, hippie kind of way <laughs> to please pick up your chairs and stack them uh, along the edge here and we'll work together 